Aujourd'hui, c'est euh, la conférence finale de, de chez Rising Stats, Stéphane Schiffard. Merci pour être ici et sur le Zoom. Et alors, euh, OK, euh, merci Galia. Euh, mais je parle en anglais quand même. OK. <rire> Est-ce que je voyais que tu parlais en français? Alors, euh... Okay, uh, so um, let me just uh, go a little bit back in uh, in my uh, in the slides I, I presented uh, yesterday uh, to maybe to sum up the um, the point where we we had uh, we had arrived, and so the, uh, the the first idea I developed was that there is an, uh, some interesting quantity which is to know the uh, pointwise regularity exponent, and I mentioned the older. Uh, exponent as the most uh, classical and the most widely used. And the next, the next step is to go uh, beyond that in order to understand the, the oscillatory behavior of the, of the data, of the function you consider in the neighborhood of a singularity. And in order to, to, to express it, to unfold it, one way is, is to consider simultaneously several exponents. So, um, I introduced a p exponents, which are basically like older exponents, except that we look at, a, instead of looking at a local L infinity norm of the function, we, we look at a local LP norm of the function. And uh, another um, degree of, of latitude we, we have is also to, to take a, a fractional integral or a fractional derivative. And so we have actually two, two parameters with which we can use and see how the, the regularity exponent changes with these two parameters. So the, 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 the maximal information, if you, if you keep all the information, so all the all p exponents of fractional uh, integral or derivatives of your, of your function, at every point you will have a function of two variables, which I call the, the fractional exponent, h, which is just the p exponent, except that we express it as a function of one over p of a fractional, uh, fractional integral of order s. And we subtract s so that for, uh, for, for simple singularities, like cupped singularities, this function is constant. And we, we, we want to understand when it's not constant, how it's varying, and what, what does it express on the on the data? What, what does it mean when, when you look at near the singularity, what's, uh, What's happening? Okay, so basically, and we had uh, finished with that. This, this is too, too much information. You are, you are storing a function uh, at every point, a function of two variables, which expresses all the information you can sum up concerning its, its regularity. It's too much, and we just want to, uh, to keep a few parameters instead of the, of the wool, uh, wool regularity. So usually, one keeps uh, one regularity parameter, which can be either um, uh, an older exponent or a p exponent, and two uh, two derivatives. Uh, okay, what's happening here? Uh, okay, yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, and um, so let me see. Okay, this was just what what are these function? So two derivatives, so that. You are, we have a, a sim, simple characterization of the of the nice prototypes of singularity that we have. For instance, for a cusp, uh, this this uh, this exponent is constant, and if we take a derivative in the direction of of uh, p or rather of one over p, or a derivative in the direction of the fractional integration of the parameter s, it doesn't change anything. And as opposed to that, we can we can introduce an oscillation exponent, which is just uh, um, the derivative in the direction of s, which which will be useful for functions which are not like curves, but which are like either the syncomb that I introduced uh, yesterday or the or the chirps. So let me show you the chirp again. What, what we call chirp, which is not exactly the chirp we had uh, last uh, last Friday for the gravitational wave okay and you can make and i had stopped with that a difference between this type of singularities and this type of singularities by the fact that the this, this 
uh, in these type of oscillations they are not really oscillations. I mean, you could take, for instance, the absolute value, you, you would have exactly the same exponent. It's just the fact that you have some, uh, some very thin um, uh, piece of, of combs so that when you compute P exponent, you take averages and you compute a, a, a kind of average and the P exponent is different from the, uh, from the older exponent. Whereas in this case, uh, when you take, for instance, of, um, when you take P exponent, it does not, uh, it's very straightforward computation. It's, it's, it does not change uh, if P is, is varying, but uh, you can see the fact that there are oscillations by the fact that if you, if you take a primitive, and this is just uh, integration by part, very simple, the older exponent is increased by more than, um, than one. Okay, and this is really because of the positive and negative oscillations. If you take an absolute value of this function, you completely destroy this, uh, this property, which was not the case for the thin combs. So basically, we have three exponents to, uh, I would say, to, 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 to make differences between these three types of behaviors, which are characteristics of, of different phenomena. One is lacunarity, and one is... Uh, uh, and one here is, is uh, an uh, oscillatory behavior. Uh, okay, uh, so let me now uh, show you a few examples. So I, I come back to, to, to this example I like very much because you, you, you can say a lot on it, the Riemannian differentiable uh, function, which, has, which I have already mentioned uh, several times, which has no lacunary singularity. And you can, uh, you can prove that either it has just cusp cusp-like cusp -like singularity, so the older exponent is just increased by one if you, if you take a primitive, for instance, or these exceptional points at some, uh, at some rationals, which are not all rationals, but rationals which can be written as a quotient of two odd numbers, where you have something which is a little bit like the, the chirp I was showing, um, uh, with with an exponent, basically, if I uh, come back to this, uh, uh, to you see this sign one over x minus x naught to the beta. Here, it's it's not a sign; it's again the Riemann function, and it's not beta; it's a one. Uh, okay, so the this oscillation exponent is is equal to one. Uh, okay, and okay, let's, I mean, th this is not directly interesting. The, the older exponent um, at every point is actually given by the, um, uh, by the Diophantin approximation properties of the, of the irrational point you, you consider. Um, okay, so, um, let me show you another, another nice example where we can uh, really work out the mathematics, uh, which is lacunary wavelet series. And the idea is, uh, the idea is very simple. You take, you take a wavelet series, and at each scale, uh, you pick a certain number of wavelet coefficients, a few, few of them which won't be zero. All the other ones will be zero. And, and the ones that you, that you have picked at random, you give them a given value to the two to the minus uh, alpha j. Okay, so it's a very simple model, but which has uh, it's it's it, it's a toy model to uh, to 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 express the fact that you have a, a sparse wavelet expansion. As I said, most most of the wavelet coefficients are just zero, and you have a few non-zero wavelet coefficients. So you, this is a sample path uh, of of such a, a random process. And the, the nice thing is that if you mix sparsity and randomness, uh, as exactly as in this case, you have um, you have la la lacunary singularities, which are really not, not exceptional, like uh, the, these uh, chirps in, in Riemann function, which just show up at rationals. But here it's almost everywhere. You have uh, you have lacunary singularities. And uh, the, the exponents depend on, uh, again, some kind of Diophantine approximation properties, a little bit like in Riemann function, except that it's not Diophantine approximation. It's uh, approximation by these random locations where you have uh, non-zero wavelet coefficients. So it's a kind of random, random Diophantine approximation. 
But, but the important message is really that you have uh, these very simple stochastic processors in, in which you have this, uh, this lacunarity, uh, lacunarity exponent, uh, which are predominant, which are almost everywhere. And the, the cusp points, there are some cusps, they are dense, but they are uh, uh, not only of measure zero, but actually of, of uh, Osdorf dimension zero. So it's a very, very small set of uh, cusp-like singularities. And most, really most points have this la lacunary singularity. Uh, okay, so this is um, also the, uh, you know, this is not very important. It's uh, uh, to know exactly what what is this this uh, this uh, uh, this function h for 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 this point. Uh, but but this is the important message: the fact that uh you can go out of this very simple model make it a little bit com more complicated but as soon as you have some random length in the locations of the wavelet coefficients and uh, unsparsity then you have uh, automatically you have lacunary singularities uh okay i want I, I want to mention i think i mentioned it yesterday but um i i want to mention again the case of levy processors well, the situation is much less clear. There are very few results. A few, a few results have been obtained by Paul Balanza uh, something like 10 years ago uh, concerning the, the, the nature of the singularities. And he showed that for, for some Levy processes, uh, so basically a Levy process depends on a, on a measure, which uh, it, it processes with jumps, with jump on a dense set of points. And uh, there is a Levy measure associated with these processes. And uh, with which can I mean, which can take many many different um, uh, which can have many different behaviors. And Paul Balanza studied basically two cases: the case of the Le where the Levy measure is symmetric with respect to to zero. So the Levy measure gives you the, the, the basically the density of jumps of a certain uh, uh, of a certain size. So uh, it tells you, for instance, that if you look at jumps of about that, that size, you will have uh, basically this, uh, this number of jump on, a, on an interval of length one. And if the Levy measure is symmetric, it means that you will have positive and negative jumps, which will be of about the same size. And this, is, this will imply that there are lacunary singularities, a little bit like well, what's happening for random wavelet series. And if you have a Levy measure which uh, which is supported by uh, uh, oh here it is uh, for instance by R plus so you just have positive jumps uh, then you have um, uh, then you have no lacunary singularities so we just obtain these two results and and uh, nothing more. Uh, and so it leaves it leaves open many interesting situations where we really don't know what the the singularities of Levy processes look like, and um, this is very frustrating. So we would like to put them numerically in evidence, and I will say uh, I will talk a little bit about that later. Um, okay, and in order to do that, in order to have numerical methods. That, that allow to put in evidence the fact that you have uh, this type of singularities, either lacunary or oscillating. The idea is that if you, if you try to do local analysis to, to, to pick a point, so for instance, on the top, uh, top right, this is a sample pass of a Levy process, you, you, you won't be able to, to do anything. Uh, so, so the idea is that you have to, uh, to, to find a detour uh, in order to to put in evidence the existence of this type of singularities in a numerically stable way, just by working not on not with a local analysis for which you have uh, too too little data basically, but a global analysis that would put that into uh, into evidence, and this is done by multifactorial analysis. Okay, so. So usually for, for simple models, for instance, if you are we, we understand uh, for Levy processes just the older singularities. And uh, the picture is very complicated. You have uh, for, for a given older exponent, you have a dense set of points where this, ex where this exponent is taken. So the set of points with, with a certain regularity are everywhere dense, completely mixed, 
and it's it's really horrible. So you have you have you have to to find another way to to put them in evidence, and uh, this is this is really done by uh, by multifactor analysis. So I will um, say a few words about multifactor analysis, and um, uh, the important point is is that it explains why I insisted. Uh, was it yesterday or Monday? I don't remember. On on this uh, on this multi-resolution quantities and the fact that you want to have uh, so a multi-resolution quantity which by pointwise log log plot regressions give you the corresponding exponent right? and this is really what you need in multi-factor analysis and that's why I insisted a little bit saying that wavelet leaders are the right tool for ultra exponent leaders are the right tool for p exponents uh, and so on okay and uh, the the idea which goes back to uh, seminal ideas of uh, two physicists uh, Giorgio Parisi and Uriel Frisch is 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 to 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 go back to the definition of the scaling function that I gave in the very first uh, course but actually they, they were working with a not the wavelet scaling function, the Kolmogorov scaling function, which doesn't involve wavelets, but is, is not very good for, good for that. So you have to replace it by p leader scaling function if you are, for instance, interested in, 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 uh, in uh, p exponents or uh, leaders if you are interested in older exponents. And the idea is to, to derive by the same formula, by a log log pot regression. Um, uh, a, a scaling function. And the, the advantage of taking uh, leaders or p leaders is that it's, it's defined in a robust way, even for, for negative values of the, of the moment, for negative values of, of the Q here, which is uh, very important in, uh, in several applications. And wh wh whereas the wave scaling function is, uh, is well defined only for. Uh, for q positive if you take a q negative you 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 rise the wavelet coefficient to a negative power and it's uh, totally unstable because it can be zero or close to close to zero whereas if you use wavelet leaders or p leaders since you take a uh, suprema of wavelet coefficients or little lp norm of wavelet coefficients if it's it cannot be close to zero and uh, or if it's close to zero it really mean means something it cannot be close to zero by accident in some way and the, you, you can show that the indeed the way that the p leader scaling function is well defined in a, in in some way uh, for for negative values of q. Uh, okay, so let me uh, just show you, uh, uh, for instance, some some analysis that we did recently on uh, on marathon data. Uh, so if you for those who were at the summer uh, summer school, there was a um, uh, there was a poster on this uh, on this data, and this is, uh, for instance, uh, the 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 the, um, uh, the two leaders scaling function. So we have to take two leaders, so uh, p equal two, because if you remember what I said yesterday, for such data, you cannot use wavelet leaders because the data cannot be modeled by uh, locally bounded function. And whereas you can use uh, for p equal two, it's okay. And you can use uh, p leaders for, for p equal two. So this is an example of a scaling function. And this, this is for another runner, uh, you get, uh, uh, you get an analysis based on one leaders because for, for this runner, you have to take uh, P equal one. This is just an, uh, an illustration. Uh, okay, and the idea of the multifactor formalism, and we talk a lot about that during the, during the summer school, if you, if you were there, is that um, the Legendre transform of, this, uh, of such a scaling function gives some information on the what we call the multifactor spectrum which is a fractal dimension of the set of points where where the the regularity exponent take, takes a given value okay so uh, the multi, what we call the multifractal p spectrum is i, I just said the osdorf dimension to be precise so if you're not used with osdorf dimension think of fractal dimension and it gives you the, the right picture of the set of points where, where the p exponent takes a given value. And what, what you can show is that you have a 
good estimation in the sense that you have always an upper bound uh, for the uh, multifactor phase spectrum in terms of this Lejeune transform. So in general, it doesn't give you exactly the uh, the multifactor phase spectrum, but uh, okay, it, it often I mean there's, there's a lot of literature on when when, when there is equality in this um, upper bound. Uh, however, there is one case which is very interesting in many applications, which is the case where the um, which actually happens uh, happens uh, sometimes. Uh, when the scaling function is a linear function. So in that case, the Legend transform is just, uh, if you make the computation, it just minus infinity everywhere, and it just uh, D at one point. So that means that the spectrum, if, if, a, if, um, if a spectrum takes the value uh, minus infinity, it means that you are computing the dimension of the empty set. By, by convention, the, the empty set has dimension uh, minus infinity. And so that means that there is just one exponent for which the dimension is positive. So that means that your data have everywhere the same regularity, just like the Brownian motion that I was uh, showing yesterday. So this is particular case, but this is an interesting case because it's a, it's a situation where this up, upper bound allows you to settle completely the, the regularity problem of your data. You know that everywhere you have the same exponent. And, and the important point is that you, you have this information, not it's a kind of miracle, not by doing an analysis at every point. You have a global analysis. You compute this scaling function, this Legend transform. So it, it's numerically very robust. And you can infer from this analysis, just in this case, of course, the regularity at every point without having to estimate it at every point. Okay, so it's uh, it's it's quite remarkable actually. So that's why I wanted to to point that out. And uh, okay, so there was a whole mathematical literature. I don't want to go into that, but I can give you a reference if you're interested. When when there is equality or not equality. There are many mathematical models where there is equality, but, uh, but it, it's also very easy to, uh, to work out uh, quantum examples. Uh, and there, there are yeah, two, two big uh, areas of research. One are general results. So for instance, in the sense of bear, you show that in a certain function, uh, function space, almost every function, and you have to define properly what is meant by almost every function, satisfies the uh, multifactor formalism. Or for particular models, and uh, people are, are particularly interested, for instance, in the, uh, there has been a lot of work on the, on the turbulence models, because uh, all, all this area of work started in turbulence. For instance, I mentioned the, the name of, uh, I mean, it all started with the work of Kolmogorov on turbulence in the 40s, but I also mentioned the, the name of Uriel Frisch, who is a very famous uh, researcher in turbulence, and we introduce with uh, Giorgio Parisi this, um, this ideas of multifactor analysis. So proving that uh, turbulence model satisfies the multifactor formalism has been has been uh, has attracted a lot of uh, lot of attention. Um, okay, so uh, to to do classification in particular for for um, I mean in signal processing. People don't, don't like to do classification with a wool curve. So we'll, uh, very often people use, uh, extract a few parameters from this Legendre le spectrum. Uh, one is H mean, which I already, which I mentioned yesterday, which, I be, which can be computed directly from the wavelet coefficient by a simple uh, log log poc regression. You compute the largest wavelet coefficient at each scale and you do log log poc regression of the largest wavelet coefficient versus the scale. And this gives you the H mean, which is uh, the, the, the starting point of the, you see the, the, the first exponent uh, at uh, where the spectrum starts. And uh, there is the uh, C1, which is the position of the maximum of the, the top of the spectrum. So this is also an important parameter because it, it gives you the regularity uh, almost everywhere of the data. Okay, so it tells you if, if I pick a point at random, I will, the, the, the regularity will be exactly C1. And there is a, another uh, 
uh, another exponent which is often used, which is a C2, which basically expresses, uh, gives some information on the width, uh, width of the spectrum. So if, um, uh, if the spectrum is, is, is restricted to a point, so if its width is exactly zero, it will mean, uh, as I said before, that the elder regularity will be the same everywhere. And here you have elder exponents or, or p exponent, if we are working with p exponents, which takes values between this h mean and uh, the, the top, which I uh, did not mention, which we call uh, h max. Uh, and, and this gives you a kind of statistical repartition of the singularity. So for, for given h, you have the corresponding dimension of the set of points uh, where, where, the, uh, where the exponent state takes the corresponding value. Uh, okay, so this is again uh, also on this marathon runners data on which we worked a lot uh, recently. This is the uh, heartbeat interval, so the 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 time between two consecutive uh, uh, heartbeats of the of the runner, and this is what you what you obtain uh, performing a Legendre one spectrum. So for p equal one, you, you use p leaders for p equal one because you cannot model this, this data by uh, locally bounded function. Well, it's kind of clear. If you look at it, it doesn't look like a bounded function. Uh, okay. So this is uh, just out of curiosity. I don't want to, to go into that. Uh, actually, the, the physiologist we were working with uh, who gave us the data of uh, marathon runners. So actually, it's uh, Veronique Billard. Uh, who is uh, working um, in uh, in, a, in a lab of uh, physiology of sport, and she was interested in understanding um, the evolution of the data between the first half of the marathon, where the mo most marathon runners have a kind of um, even way of running for the first half and at the end there are big differences so we we we, we wanted to to see what was happening between the first half and the last fourth of the because we don't know exactly when the uh, when the shift takes place between the these two um these two periods uh, so uh these the little arrows are showing the evolution in the um uh H, so in um, the x-axis is h mean and the y-axis is c1. So a point mean that uh, a point at the beginning of the arrow means for for instance for m1 marathon uh, runner one that is h mean and c1 were at a given position and it shifted toward at the end of the race at the um, uh, towards another position. And uh, so they they like these pictures because it you 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 can see uh, differences between um, people who are uh, used to run marathons or people who are more amateur runners and uh, different different strategies of uh, uh, of um, of dealing with their uh, with their race and the the idea of Veronique was was to to try to extract from this uh, from this multi Fractality parameters as much information as possible that could be supplied to the runner, explaining uh, why they, they uh, if they uh, are handling the race properly and or maybe not optimally, and, and try to give, give them some uh, some advice. So we, we are far from doing that, but at least we we start to see some some things which which seem to be related with their uh, the behavior of racing. Yes. How do you make up the find that first H mean decreases, mostly decreases, and there is some negative value? Uh, for H mean, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So the yeah, there are negative values of H mean. H mean can take positive or negative values if if um, uh, if if the if the data can be modeled by uh, locally bounded function uh, functions, the, the H mean will be positive. But here. I showed, I said that some of the data cannot be, and that means that the H mean is negative. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, that's absolutely possible. Uh, 
Yeah. It, it will mean that you, you, you don't have older exponents, you cannot use leaders, you have to use P leaders. And um, actually for some data, for the cadence uh, uh, of the runners, you know, the number of steps per, per minute, uh, even th there is no, uh, no P exponent which works. Okay, so when you have so, so for cadence, you have two strategies. Uh, up to recently, we are just taking a, a fractional integral of the data, so that's the, the standard method, and you take it of a sufficient order so that uh, you can use p leaders or you can even if you if you integrate enough. Uh, but we 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 were not very pleased with that because it's it's modifying the data. You're, you're not, not more working with initial data, and now we have um, we have used. And this uh, was used another exponent, and this makes me come back to, to the beginning of my talk of Friday that uh, Yves Meyer introduced in this little book I was mentioning, um, uh, which was uh, written after his uh, CRM, his Eisenstadt lectures, uh, 30 years ago. He introduced this weak scaling exponent, which is a regularity exponent uh, that can be defined for. Uh, Without any um, any assumption, I mean, it, if you have a, a Schwarz distribution, you can define this weak scaling exponent. And uh, so, he, in this little book, it, it's really a marvelous little book. You should uh, all buy it, and uh, or maybe you, I'm sure you can find it somewhere here. <laughs> and uh, it, it contains a lot of ideas which has, have not been exploited. And, and, and we took one of them, which was uh, maybe for this data, and in the case of cadence, it's really uh, uh, a situation where you cannot use any P exponent. And we made analysis, I won't have time to show it, but if, if some of you are interested, we can talk about that later. Made the multi-factor analysis using this weak scaling exponent uh, to, uh, to analyze directly the um, uh, cadence of uh, marathon runners. But this, I mean, uh, there are uh, actually, um, uh, Philip Tiusiu gave us also some, uh, some data for which he could not use uh, any P exponent. And we are, we are now uh, uh, trying to, to, to make an analysis of, uh, uh, I, I think it's uh, some uh, MEG data that he has, which, uh, for which he cannot, uh, yeah, he, he cannot use any, any P exponent. Okay, anyway, uh, what is the same? The book of Mayer, it's... Uh, no, 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 it's a book only in English. It's a little CRM book uh, that, that, he, that, that was edited after his, uh, his lectures here. Uh, I... I uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean the CRM book, and uh, I, I don't know what he talked about during these lectures. But do, were you at these uh, media lectures? Yeah. yeah, yeah, but you don't remember what he talked about. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, this is this little book, which I mean, which is marvelous. It's, uh, um, okay, so just to to show you uh, some uh, uh, Levy processors and fractional Levy. So by fractional Levy processors, we, we we talk about either fractional integrals or fractional derivative of Levy processors. And uh, okay, so what? Uh, so this is just a formula of how to uh, how to compute the the fractional uh, fractional integral on a sample pass. Uh, so the, I mean, the formula is not, not really important, but I wanted to show you the, uh, the numerics. And um, uh, also Paul Balanza also in his thesis uh, determines the, the older spectrum um, when, uh, when, you, uh, when you take a fractional integral. Uh, and there is no, uh, as far as I think, uh, the, for instance, if you take a fractional derivative of a Levy process, uh, since it has this continuity, the, the sample paths are no more locally bounded. But for, for if, if the order of the fractional derivative is not too big, you can, you can use a P-spectrum. And these are completely open problems. So what is the P-spectrum of a fractional derivative of Levy process? Um, and as I said, I, I, another uh, big big issue is to put in evidence this uh, lacunary singularity. Okay, so let me just show you here. 
uh, on the left, you have a sample path of a Levy process and with its uh, theoretical uh, spectrum below, which is a straight line starting from zero. And if you take um, if you take a fractional derivative, so this is um, a sample path, which is uh, it's not very clear why it's, it's kind of clear that it's no more locally bounded. I mean, you see that there are peaks, and actually there's a dense set of peaks where it goes to 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 infinity. And basically, you uh, uh, you expect the spectrum. I mean, there is no theorem, but there is kind of a good. Uh, uh, good evidence that uh, that the spectrum uh, the, the p the all all p spectrum coincide and are shifted uh, to the to the left by the amount of uh, fractional derivative uh, okay and if you if you if you do it even even more it goes even more on the on the left okay and uh, this is um uh, so this is what we uh, uh, so for uh, on the left again it's the it's it's still the the the, um, the Levy process and all p exponents numerically all p exponents coincide which is a, a kind of uh, a kind of good uh, now if if you shift. Uh, uh, you see the the, the 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 p exponent behave badly because for some of them you it, it's forbidden to to uh, to estimate them. I mean you are, you are in the case where the p exponent cannot be cannot be used, and the, of course if you still use them, the, the the numerics give you something, but something which is wrong, and it's wrong by the fact that it's uh, it's it's blocked. The, the beginning is right, but it's, it, it does not capture the end, uh, the end of the spectrum and the, the, the most negative uh, singularity. Okay, uh, so this is the uh, this is basically the message for if if if, if you are in the in, in the range of p's which is allowed by your computation of the wave scaling function and which tells you. You, you have the right to compute p exponent. You get the right spectrum, and if you do something which is forbidden, you are punished, and you get the, the wrong spectrum. So it's even more more obvious if you take a, a stronger fractional derivative. For instance, this is the theoretical spectrum uh, uh, on the um, uh, in black, and if you use wavelet leaders, you get something which is completely wrong because you are blocked by zero by the exponent zero because by definition, wavelet leaders cannot compute negative uh, exponent. If you if you start to use uh, p leaders, but for a p which is too big, you get something a little bit better. But still, you are you are blocked too early, and uh, the as you go down in p's and and close to the uh, to the value for which you are uh, you are in good shape, you are allowed to use uh, the multifactorial analysis. Using this um, this p exponent, you get something which gets qu quite close to the to the right uh, 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 to the right uh, spectrum. Okay, so let me go back and show you some uh, some numerical uh, uh, analysis that was done by uh, Quentin Rible, and he also showed uh, that if for, for those of you who were at the um, at the summer school, as I was also a poster about that, uh, but I think it's it's very nice. Uh, so uh, let me just remind you: there is there are no lacunary singularities in Riemann function. It has it has cusp singularities which correspond to the rising part of the spectrum. So uh, the spectrum is you start from one half it's uh, the, the uniform regularity uh, is one half i more or less give a proof of that during the first the first day you go up to three fourths where you, you have the almost every regularity and you have a straight line here and you have this exceptional rational point so rational means that the dimension is zero where you have exponents three half and uh and you have a chirp there okay so um how could we put in evidence the fact that, that there are chirps numerically? 
one way one way is, is to say okay if i if i take a if i if, if, if i take for instance just a primitive of the of the riemann function for for this this part of the spectrum which corresponds to cusp in the data uh, this part will be shifted by uh, by one if i take a primitive okay so this part will go here uh, maybe i have no i don't have uh, other colors so maybe I'll I'll, um, uh, I'll do it uh, with uh, a dotted line. So you expect this part to be just shifted because these are cusp. So you take a primitive, you shift by one. Okay. So you expect to find something like that. And for the uh, for the chirp which was here, if you take a primitive, you shift it by two. Okay. So this will go to three half plus two, so it's something like that, okay? And you should remember also that uh, if we, we are computing a, Le, a, a Lejeune transform, so we, we don't get the spectrum, we get the concave hull of the spectrum. This is just because we, we are using uh, a Lejeune transform. So in the first case, what you expect numerically, the best you can expect numerically is to obtain this. And in the second case, what you expect is that is to obtain this. So you 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 will see the fact that you have uh, chirps in your data just because your your, your spectrum with uh, if you take a fractional integral, your spectrum will will stretch in some way. Will uh, okay. And uh, so this is just for uh, for Riemann's function. And. Uh, yeah, so this is p, p exponents. So as expected, if you if you change the value of p, you don't you 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 don't see a difference. Except that we don't know actually we 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 don't know what we should get on the on the right for the, uh, the there is no result on the um, uh, if you take uh, yeah p exponent of the Riemann function, but we. Uh, uh, so this was sorry. This was still yeah for 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 fractional integral. Uh, um, let me see. That was for s equal. I don't remember for each. For uh, yeah, yeah, it was uh, okay. Yeah, that was uh, if we are taking a fractional derivative. I did not. So we are, we we have shifted on the right. So we took a fractional derivative of the Riemann function, which is um, of a of an order big enough so that the um, uh, it, it's no more uh, it's no more locally bounded so so the series you take an s uh, small enough so that the typically the, the series is is no more uniformly convergent and you have actually neg negative values and for p equal to there is a very nice work of uh, stefan sore and andrea nubis where where they computed the, the two spectrum so the so this is why we we drew the theoretical two spectrum, but they just computed this part. They uh, they 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 could not uh, determine what's on the right of of this part. So that, that's why I put an inter interrogation mark. But we we really expect that it's uh, that that uh, what I wrote here happens. And that, so the, the 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 chirp are just moving. What we conjecture is that the here when you take a f the, the the chirp don't, don't see the difference between the p exponent like the cusps because function sine one over x don't does not see the, the difference and it moves if you take a fractional integral or a fractional differentiation it bo it moves twice as fast as the cusp points okay so that's that's really the natural conjecture but there is no result uh, on that okay but let me just show you. Okay, several. Uh, uh, okay, in the middle, maybe you don't see very well. Uh, several fractional dif uh, dif uh, differential and, and, and primitives. So some you see here go a little bit on the uh, below below zero, and, um, and and you see. You see what I was mentioning. You, you see numerically that the spectrum is getting wider. So you can say that there is numerical evidence that, that there is a chirp in, in, in the Riemann data. Okay, so that's 
why am I so much talking about that? Be because of, of, of what I mentioned in, the, uh, in, in Friday's talk about the fact that you, you expect to see behaviors like that in, in turbulence data, and it's a big issue to determine if indeed there are, there, there are some, some singularities in turbulence which, which have this kind of, of chirp-like behavior or not, because it would validate or invalidate some turbulence models, and it, it also, I mean, it would give some, some comprehension of the, of, the, of the mechanical phenomena that are happening in turbulence. So it's good to know that for this specific function that somehow shows up in turbulence, you, you, you can numerically see something. Okay, uh, okay, I have a few minutes to tell you about multivariate analysis and why it, it can bring some information on this type of data. So this is a picture I borrowed from a, a talk of Philippe Soussou, <laughs> maybe you recognize. So one motivation of our multivariate, by multivariate analysis, uh, I don't like the term very much, but what, what people in signal processing mean is just you are analyzing several signals simultaneously. Okay, so it's not a function of several variables, it's several signals. And uh, typically the, the, the application that uh, Philippe Soussou and, and, and people who are dealing with brain data are interested in is uh, really this, uh, these data which are captured in the brain where you, now you can capture simultaneously a lot of, lot of signals and, and you want to understand uh, how, how they are correlated from a multifactorial point of view. So how the sets of singularity of each signals are in some sense correlated. Okay, so you have, uh, so you start with M signals. And for each signal, you have a certain uh, regularity exponent and you have a corresponding multi-resolution quantity as usual, given by the same log log regression formula. And you, what you are interested in is, in is computing the, uh, the joint multifactorial spectrum. So I, I shift to M equal two to, to have things simple here. So you, we assume that we have two signals and you're interested in determining the Osdorf dimension of the set of points where the first exponent takes a given value and the second exponent takes uh, another value. So actually, you, you, Mathematically, it means that you are interested in, in the computing the Osdorf dimension of an intersection of two fractal sets. Okay, so that's that's bad news actually because there's a, a huge mathematical literature on the uh, by people working in, in fractals on the dimensions of intersection and it's uh, uh, extremely complicated. So there are books by um, Perti Matila that I yeah I was uh, I was mentioning you, which uh, give some light of the subject, but the, um, the quick conclusion is that it's very, very complicated problem. Okay, so, so what, what people in, in signal processing did was just to say, hey, may, maybe we can, uh, we can work out a, 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 a multifactor formalism just by keeping the same ID. So I have two exponents and instead of, of computing uh, scaling function of one variable will compute scaling function of two variables. So we'll consider sums of, the instead of having just the first multi-resolution quantity to a certain power, I have the first multi-resolution quantity to the power P and the second to the power Q. I make a log-log plot regression. I have a scaling function of two variables and I take a Legendre transform in two variables and maybe, maybe that will give me some information about the uh, multivariate uh, uh, the multivariate uh, spectrum okay so the bad news and uh, many people miss that point and I, actually we we've, we we raise that by uh, by chance because we i mean the, the 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 proof of the upper bound in uh, in one variable is is so simple that you just have the feeling that it works in two variables and you don't have to check anything but if you are careful and you check, you see that it's wrong. And not only is the proof wrong, but it's very easy to, to prove counterexamples where the Legendre transform is, is not at the same location as the, as the so, the, so immediately there are many, many uh, mathematical problems that we don't know how to deal with. I mean, uh, when, when 
on which condition so now we have a few information and uh, uh, some con some natural i mean no, maybe not so natural conditions on which you have an upper bound but it's not very satisfactory because we don't have any criterion that you can check on data okay so you have to to to, to you have to make an act of faith in some way to uh, to be sure that there's an upper bound and uh, actually, uh, another question is also to just, I mean, we can compute that. So which information does this Legendre spectrum give on, on the data? This is also an interesting problem uh, on which we have a few information. So we are really here uh, reaching the, uh, the boundaries of uh, our knowledge. Um, uh, so the yeah maybe I'll, I'll skip the the heuristic determination because it's it's wrong. So uh, it just shows you why why people did expect this formula to hold. But maybe I will just uh, skip that and go to um, uh, uh, go to a few examples. So so for the, the the most stupid case, you do the the bivariate analysis of a function and the same function. And uh, you get what you expect. The fact that it is a, the first exponent take a given value, the second exponent, which is the same, takes the same value. So your your bivariate spectrum will be supported by a by a straight line h1 equals h2. Okay. Uh, now, if we have independent stochastic processors, you can also make a little computation on the using the the independence. Uh, you have a, you have a formula for the uh, for the scaling function, and you have a beautiful formula which tells you that the scaling function is the sum of the scaling function of the two processors. So that means that that if you take the Legend transform, it means that you have the formula in red for the Legend transform, and that's very interesting because it's 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 the first formula you guess if you take the if you take the intersection of two uh, of two sets. For instance, if you if you have a not fractal set but a nice set, like if you take, um, uh, I mean, in the three D space, uh, a plane on uh, two planes, uh, the generically their intersection will be a straight line, okay. And if you generalize that uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to n dimensional spaces, the formula is that the co-dimensions generically the co-dimensions add up. Okay, and this is exactly what this uh, this tells you: the the, the co-dimension, the d minus the dimension uh, add up. So, in the case of independent stochastic processors, at least for le, for for Legendre spectrum, not not necessarily uh, that that that's the tricky point for the real dimension, the real fractal dimension, but for the Legendre transform, the the co-dimension formula holds. And uh, now, if you, if you want to know, there are a few a few results. For instance, in the in the book of Matilda, generic results on uh, fractals which you uh, which you intersect. If you if you move them somehow randomly, you have a generic results on the dimension of intersection. And sometimes you also have this formula. So this is a good candidate for uh, for the multifactor for the bivariate multifactor formalism. But uh, again, it's not. Um, uh, it, it's far from covering the, uh, the the general case, and I would like just to show you a few numerical examples. So something uh, a very simple case that we could work out numerically are binomial cascades. Uh, so you 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 construct a measure by um, uh, binomial measure. So you put the the weight at p. Uh, on the left and uh, 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 q equal one minus p on the right, and then you you multiply, uh, and depending on p or p or q, you get uh, this kind of binomial cascade. And what 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 we can what you can prove is that if the two cascades are basically positively correlated, so for instance, if the first one uh, you the, the the weight you put on the right is larger than uh, on the left, and you do the same on the second one, even if the values are different, your your bivariate spectrum are completely correlated, and they are theoretically on a straight line. And in practice, uh, the Legend spectrum is, is close also to be uh, on a straight line. On the bottom left, 
This is theoretical spectrum, and on the bottom right, the one obtained numerically, which we try to, to draw as best as possible. And, but if you anti-correlate them, then you, you get uh, uh, a spectrum which is really supported by a, by a big set, and you, you, you don't have this, you lose this perfect correlation. Uh, and so we did some analysis on uh, marathon runners' uh, data. So the, uh, basically, the conservative conclusion is that if, if you have a bivariate spectrum, which seems to be uh, localized on a kind of thin set, it, it will mean that you, you have a strong correlation between the data. And if it's localized on uh, something big, big, it means that you have either no correlation or anti-correlation in the data. Okay, this, this seems to be secure. And uh, for instance, if you look at heartbeat versus speed for the marathon runners, you see something which is quite well uh, localized, but not perfectly. So it, it, it means that the singularities of the two data are kind of well uh, well correlated, and it's much, much, much better for speed versus uh, cadence of the step, uh, which is which are very, very much uh, correlated, which makes sense. I mean, uh, if you increase your speed, your your cadence will also. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's clearly more more related than than heartbeat with speeds, which for which we, you will have some uh, some delay. And okay, I wanted to finish with that. Uh, one of our purposes, and there, there are no theoretical results right now, uh, is to, because we, we don't have this upper bound, which is known to be wrong, but maybe we fall in cases where it could be right, and I'm, I don't know about that. We could detect oscillating singularities by making a multi-factor an analysis of, uh, of two signals which, which are derived from the same data. So for instance, we could think we can take the, um, uh, the signal and it's primitive. And if you have only cusp-like singularities, all the, uh, all the exponents will be shifted by one exactly. So your bivariate spectrum will be supported on, on the straight line, uh, H2 equals H1 plus one. So this is a good indication. And if you do that, for instance, here for uh, orbit frequency, you get something which is really uh, perfectly located on that. So since there is no theoretical upper bound, you, mathematically you cannot conclude. But I mean, uh, you can say that it's numerical evidence that there are only cusp on that uh, that type of data. Uh, this is also the case for um, uh, cadence. And also, and also a little bit less, but still well, well the case for acceleration of these uh, marathon runners. Okay, so I will stop here. And this, this, this is really, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, the direction we would like to investigate mathematically and, and numerically. Right. Is there any questions? Uh, or from online? Um, Thank you. Maybe I'll ask later. So let's thank uh, yeah, for the uh, yeah. you know, quotes here. You have